Welcome to a special edition of The Grueling Truth. I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in from the 1981 NCAA National Championship team, the Indiana Hoosiers, Steve Risley. How you doing tonight, Steve? Doing great, Mike. Out here in uh, Los Angeles. Um, it's a three-hour time difference from, from you guys, but uh, enjoying life out here right now and, and having a good time and, and uh, watching things happen. All right, so let's just start from, I know you were born in Missouri. Um, what age did you move to Indianapolis, and when did you first develop a love for basketball? I, you know, I, we moved into Indianapolis. Actually, my father was in the military, so we spent the first five or six years of my life in Germany, um, and then moved back here and ended up in Fortville, Indiana, of all places. And uh, I can never remember not having a – I was about six years old when we moved here – Never remember not having a basketball in my hand. I mean, I, I just don't ever remember a point in time when my focal point wasn't basketball. Yeah, and I think that's almost anybody that grew up in the 60s, 70s, even the 80s in Indiana can relate to. Um, you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, my favorite sporting event in the history of Western civilization is not March Madness. It's not the Super Bowl. It's the old Indiana High School Athletic Association basketball tournament. You want to tell people what it was like to play high school basketball back in the mid, mid-70s mid in the state of Indiana? It was probably like an evangelical church experience, I mean, for for four weeks uh, of it. And, and it was everybody just – dreamed and, and waited for that tournament to start in February and, and you know, everything geared toward that. And it was just so much fun to get in. And we were very fortunate to play in the Hinkle sectional, which doesn't exist anymore, which is very sad because there were two key components to the state tournament, in my opinion. There was the Final Four and there was the Hinkle sectional. And those two were the two most watched or – you know, written about parts of the state tournament every year. Um, and to play in that against the teams we got to play. And the sad part about the Hinkle was most of the great teams got knocked out in the sectionals and never got to only one team out of Indianapolis got to advance beyond that. And most of there, was, there was probably four or five teams were capable of winning the state tournament. And I think that's what put the onus of, of, the, of the Hinkle sectional being so great. But everywhere, you know, my wife grew up in Winslow, Indiana, and, uh, you know, she said down there that the town would shut down for the weekend for sectionals. It was shut down. I mean, if you needed a haircut, sorry, come back after sectionals. You know, if you, if you needed something uh, done to your car, sorry, come back after sectionals. So kind of a, de- a, a depiction of what Hoosiers outlined a little bit. But when you're involved in it, you get the feel of it. And, and I mean, we had a group of cheering kids called the Rowdies. They all wore the same shirt. They all did the chance where when they – the other team was announced. They put the papers up in their hands with the paper bags over their head. It was just such such a religious experience in, in, in every town. And it wasn't just Lawrence Central where I went to school. It was North Central. It was Carmel. It was Winslow, Indiana. It was Huntington. It was, it was everywhere. It's an honor. It, it, it's an honor. I mean, everywhere I go, people want to know about the state tournament, and, and, they, and they talk to me about, you know, the single class situation and, and who the champions are now, and sadly now I can't even I can't even name them um, who they used yeah, to be. Yeah, nobody cares. Single anymore. class. Yeah. Well, I don't know that nobody cares. I think that what happens is the, the caring has been fractioned off. I mean, it's the, the class A kids care about theirs, class two class, class three. It's not the everybody caring about one thing. It's everybody caring about multiple things, and it's it's really diminished it, um, in my opinion. You know, I, my, my whole theory of that whole thing was if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I don't know if we tried to fix it. I don't know if we wanted to give participation awards, what we wanted to do, but we had a gem. We had a diamond. And, you know, we, we, we had the Hope diamond, and then we started cutting it off into smaller pieces and made a bunch of great little diamonds. But you're right. It, it's, pure people care about the overall product. They care about the part of the product. Yeah, and the other thing that I don't think people understand, you look at like the Indiana State High School tournament, once you got past the sectional, I mean, the thing that made the sectional special was, like you said, with the teams in Indianapolis, but all over the place. It was usually a group of four to six, maybe eight teams, all grouped that were all from within a half hour's drive from them. There was huge rivalries in all those games. And, I mean, the bragging rights at the sectional were just as big as winning, I think, a state championship is today. 
Oh, I, I agree. I mean, I, we, I have two Hinkle sexuals under my belt. Uh, we won Hinkle uh, my junior year and my senior year, and, you know, that was a feed. That, hadn't, that doesn't get done very often where you win back-to-back Hinkles, and, and we were – you know, we never won the state, um, but we, we claimed the two Hinkle sectionals, and next to winning the state, that was a big thing. You, you were a two-time Marion County basketball champion and a two-time Hinkle sectional champion. That, that, that carried as much clout going into the Hall of Fame this year, which I went into, and that was on my resume going into the Hall of Fame that we were back to You know, I was going to bring that up. You didn't have to bring it up yourself. <laughs> oh, man, you know, I, I, it's just kind of one of those moments. I went in with that. I don't know. If I got elected to that, I'd have probably brought it up as soon as I got introduced. But, 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 you know, I went in with some pretty big names, and, and so it was Glenn Robinson, Alan Anderson. So I'm kind of one of those, oh, yeah, <laughs> he him too. <laughs> Phil Eisenberger and myself. But anyway, besides the point. The great thing about the regionals when it came in was, you know, you knew the teams in the sectionals. You knew who you were playing. You knew you knew North Central. You knew Chittard. You knew Tech. But you got to the regionals, man, and you start playing the Columbus East, the Richmonds. They all come into Indianapolis sectional now or regional. And you start playing these teams, boy, the fear factor goes way up because, man, you don't know these teams that well. You don't know their star players. You don't know their systems. Um, you don't see them ever except if, they, if we all get together in the regionals. And that puts a whole different onus that people don't realize on the tournament because now you're, for the first time, um, teams like us or, or whoever gets to the regionals and plays, you're just going into a blind, and it just becomes talent on talent. Um, coaching kind of goes out the door a little bit more because the coaches just a lot of, you know, they, they, they worked on, on strategy and things like that, but it was just a raw talent going and playing somebody else. So who had the best player? Yeah, I think a lot of people that against? aren't from Indiana may not understand that when you're in the regional trying to get to the semi-state, in the regional and the semi-state, you play a morning game and then the championship games in the evening, so there's almost no time to prepare anyways. But that was so fun. I mean, come on, you're 17 to 19 years old, and tell me you can't go play 30, what, 32 minutes of basketball twice in one yeah. day? My God, we used to get up at seven in the morning and go to the dust bowls or the or the or the concrete courts at Lawrence Park and play until they turned the lights off on us. And we only took we only kept score so we knew when to take a water break. I mean, and and, and we did you know winter stays up or two on one off and you played all day. So it, it was it was so much fun and it, it, it added to, it added to the pageantry of the whole thing by doing it all in one day. I mean, it was sectional day. It was regional day and. You know, we're all listening, trying to find out what's going on in the other sectionals or who's going to advance, and, and you know, they're trying to keep it from us, but they can't keep it from us. Um, you know, we're finding out from our girlfriends or whatever who's doing what in other places, and it just it just became just a mecca of a day for that four-week period. Yeah, and in 1977, you got your senior year, you guys won the sectional. Talk a little bit about how big a deal it was to win the regional back then and advance to the Sweet 16. Well, you know, we, we had a team of 10 seniors, and we thought for sure, you know, we were good enough. I mean, we, we had a balanced scoring. We had, we had really good – we had a star player who, who you know, could produce, and, and, and we had other support players that could step up and, and add 15, 20 points to a game when needed to. And we just we, – we thought, okay, this is our year. We're going to walk away from this thing, and we're going to get the state championship. And then when you get there – um, having been to the Final Four in college, I mean, it, it's a crapshoot at that point in time, you know. And yeah, and so everybody has the same up. feeling you have about your yeah, team. Yeah, exactly, and so it's a crapshoot. It's who gets lucky. You know, I, I tell everybody, in, in winning anything like that, 51% of it's luck. You know, no matter, I don't care. Everybody's talented when you get past the sections. Everybody, every team's good. So we get, we get to the regionals, and, and we go, and, and, and we draw Aurora, in, in, in the first game. That would have been the semi-state. Uh, the semi-state, right. Yeah. You know, we would gotten through the regionals, and we get to the semi-state, and we draw Aurora, and we're thinking, okay, you know, Richmond's in there. Well, Richmond plays the first game, and they get beat. And now we're thinking, okay, get by Aurora. Um, you, you, you know, we, we, we get in, and maybe we're going to play Columbus East. And, and we go through, and, boy, you know, we get into a dogfight with Aurora. And it turns into a battle with, with this kid named Tim Johnson who just was a just a hell of a shooter. One of the best pure shooters I'd ever played against and seen ever, even through college. And I mean, I was lighting it up inside and he was lighting it up outside and it just came down to a shootout and you know, boy, if he didn't get the last shot, 
and he made a count, and we ended up losing in the semi-state, and there it goes. I mean, you're, you're, you're thinking this is it. And the thing about sudden death that people don't realize is it's one and done. And, yeah, and you know, that's something that it, you – with the Indiana High School, that's something where you grew up playing with those guys. And it all comes yeah, down yeah. to that one time and that last Yeah, and, and it, like I said, it's a crapshoot. It, it, I mean, they, they, they got hot. They played probably the best game that that team has ever played in their life. And we played great, too. I mean, we didn't lose the game. Aurora won that game. But that's the beauty of the tournament is that the, the, there, there's, there's trips and falls and potholes all along the way, no matter who you are. Um, it ended up Carmel ended up winning it. And we drilled Carmel at the end of the season. I mean, and, and we, you know, we drilled Mark Herman and those guys. And they ended up winning you know, the tournament that year. And good for them because I was friends with all the kids on that team. And we played all summer together, and, and they were a good bunch of guys. And but they came out of nowhere. You know, they, they weren't really lauded as, as a team to beat. Um, they just got hot at the right time and, and pulled it off. And they didn't hit bottles. And we hit one called Tim Johnson. <laughs> yeah, he was a great player. I was from Aurora. I only got to listen to the yeah, game, but just listening to the yeah. game. I mean, That's it's one of the best games I ever it. saw because I could <laughs> yeah. picture it in my mind. It was such a good game. Yeah, he's, I, I hope he's. You know, tell I hope he Bobby plumps that thing to death. You know, that, <laughs> that shot gets longer every single time Bobby tells the story. <laughs> so, All right, right so now it's probably about a half cord that he made the shot. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great. That's another thing about. That's a great thing about the the, the the guys like Bobby Plump that come out of the tournament. And, you know, the Jimmy Rails, the Bobby Plumps, um, you know, George McGinnis's. The Steve Alfers, the Damon Bailey's, you know, playing in front of forty thousand people at the Hoosier Dome. Come on, yeah. Give me a break. I mean, George McGinnis you know, and all these guys. Um, Rick yeah. Mount, you know, Oscar, Rick Mount. I mean, that, that Larry tournament Bird. produced Larry. That that tournament produced legends. I mean, that tournament, that state tournament, when single class produced legends. It doesn't produce legends anymore because those great things never occur in the purity of the whole universe. They occur of planets in the universe. You know, that's how I look at it. The tournament now is made up of planets in the universe. When we played, it was the universe. So you, you, talked about the some of the, you talked about some of the best players in Indiana high school history. And I, was, I found an article today. It was either ESPN or Sporting News named you one of the 100 greatest players in Indiana high school basketball history. I mean, that had to be a great honor. It, 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 everything, you, whenever you get an, uh, it plumped into any group among those people um, and your name sits alongside Oscar, Larry, um, you know, Alford, I mean, Woodson, you go down the list, uh, Damon and, and Al, Alan Henderson and, and, and Calvert Chaney and, and Rick Mount. I mean, you could, you could, you know, keep going. Pete Turgovich. You keep going as long as long. Whenever your name's part of that, it, it's it, it's mind boggling. It, it, it's almost like surreal when you see your name up there. I saw that, and when you see your name up up there. It, it's it's an honor. It really wouldn't happen to leave you speechless. Then you start making up yeah. stories about it. Yeah, and, and then look at the kids right above that, you. As you said, you recently got elected to the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. I've been there before. Um, it's a great place for all the history of the tournament. And it has to be really, even on the, even above that top hundred, the fact that you're in there, and 50 years from now when people go, Steve Risley is going to be there. Yeah, I mean, it, and it, it's it's eternity. It, it becomes eternity, and, and again, it goes right back to the same story I just told about the top 100. Look at the other people who's on that same wall that my face is on, and and that that's what the tournament and what's the state tournament, what Indiana high school basketball gives back to you. Um, you know, you, you and I, 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 me personally, I know I'm in it, but I think of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame being one of the top three basketball Hall of Fames in the world. You know, you, you've got Naismith, and you know, the, the, and then you've got probably the NBA Hall of Fame, and you get the College Basketball Hall of Fame. Then you've got the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, and and Indiana, that our Hall of Fame ranks right up with those with the players that are that are honored in our Hall of Fame. You know, so it, it, it's just, it's an honor. Can't, can't right, start so, any other way. It's just a great honor. Yeah. Um, so my big thing is this. 
I mean, you're an Indiana high school basketball legend. Then you live the dream of every Hoosier, especially in the 1970s. You end up getting to go play for Bobby Knight, the Indiana Hoosiers. Can you tell me when he started recruiting you and just a little bit of the backstory of why you chose IU? Yeah, well, this is a really funny story. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, you, you haven't announced it yet, but I'll go ahead and do this for you, too. I was an All-American quarterback in high school as well. Um, so I, I was at that time one of two athletes to come out of Indiana that were two All-American athletes, George McGinnis and myself. Now, I'm sure there have been a lot of others, but I was listed on, on as, as an All-American quarterback. So I was being recruited as heavily in football as I was in basketball. The funny story there was Barry Switzer calling me, telling me he wanted to turn Oklahoma to a passing offense. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right. He, told Troy, he told Troy Aikman the same thing, and Aikman ended up at UCLA. So. Yeah, I figured I'd be a 290-pound, 6'8", defensive end by the end of my freshman season. You know, so, but um, I had actually committed to go to Notre Dame. I had talked to Dan Devine and Digger Phelps, and, and they were going to allow me to – explore both opportunities and of course at that point you couldn't sign anything but I had verbally committed never heard from Knight he had been to a couple of my games um and and my deal was I kind of wanted to announce at the end of my junior year because I wanted to enjoy my senior year and and not have being hounded about it and and, you know I kind of knew I wanted to stay close to the area and I'd never really heard from Knight I got a few notes from him saying congratulations on your win or this and I didn't see him at the games but never a face-to-face talk with him so I, you know, the Divine or, and Phelps had talked to me, and, and I thought my mom had been thrilled. I had the grades to get into Notre Dame. And, um, you know, I thought, okay, it's a great school. Notre Dame, my God. You know, I mean, it's a legend. And, um, you know, Trapezio was up there with um, Orlando Woolridge, Tracy Jackson, a team that ended up going to the Final Four, I think, um, their freshman year. Um, they had a great team. And, you know, we had gotten to be kind of close when we talking about being a cog and part of that team. But then one day I come home from school, and out of the blue, my phone's ringing, and I happen to pick it up, and it's night on the other end. And he talks to me for about 20 minutes, and, and, and then he says, well, I'd like you to come play at IU. You want to come play? And I said, sure, I'd love to. <laughs> I didn't talk to my parents. I didn't talk to my coach. didn't talk to my AD. And, and we, then he said, okay, great. Let's get an announcement out. And I said, well, i got a little problem here. And it's all about Coach Devine and Coach Phelps. And goes, and he said, well, you signed nothing, obviously. He said, don't worry about him. I'll handle those guys. And he didn't quite put it as eloquently as that. But uh, he was being <laughs> fun because he really liked, you know, he and Coach Phelps were great friends. So, yeah. And the, in my freshman year, we played Notre Dame at Market Square Arena. <laughs> and Phelps came out and read me the ride act. I mean, and Knight was watching. It was, it was humorous. It was all funny. <laughs> but um, he, he said, I'll take care of that. And I got, I got to leave it blank there because it's, it's a radio show. But it was it was a funny conversation. But that's how it happened, just just one call. And, I mean, to get right, the Iron so. Brothers to go play for Indiana University and, and, and for Bob Knight, I mean, the at that time, the best basketball program in the country. Um, a great opportunity because they'd won the national championship in 76. They had a very down year in 77. They'd lost players. Dalavicious had left and, and other players had left. And, and, you know, it was a great opportunity for a freshman to step in right there. And, and, make right, an and the 1978 an season, yeah, the 78 season, you want to talk a little bit about your adjustment from high school to college and then just a little bit about the 78 season where I think if I remember right, Indiana ended up losing by a point to Villanova in the Sweet 16. Yeah, we were well, in, in Providence, I believe it was. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I say this. The, the transition from high school to college is this. It's going – High school is going from getting patted on the ass everywhere you go to going to college and getting kicked in the ass everywhere you go. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just completely – you go in high school, you're everybody's All-American. You you're, you can do no wrong. Hey, Riz, just score 30 points for us. It's all good. You go to, you go to IU and play, and I'm going to tell you what, everybody on that floor is somebody's All-American, and yeah. they are good basketball players, and you're just getting kicked in the ass. And, I mean, and all the upperclassmen – uh, you know, I, I tell people it's like this. As a freshman, you're just absolutely in awe of everything. You're playing in front of 18,000 people. You're going to campus, and, and, and people are just talking to you and coming up to you and wanting your autograph, and, and your games are on TV. You're just in awe of the whole thing. Your sophomore year now, you're, like, scared to death because you know you're going to get yelled at. 
you go to practice, and you know it's coming, and you, you're gonna, you know you're going to screw up, and you don't really know why or what to do to stop it. Your junior year, you're kind of sitting there and scratching your head going, you know, I've seen this crap somewhere before. And in your senior year, you're laughing at the junior, sophomores, and freshmen, watching them go through all the crap that night put you through, <laughs> uh, and you're just laughing at them. Like, I oh, watch Risley. He'll, he'll piss his pants here in just a minute. <laughs> it, right, it's so thanks. funny. So it's, it, it's, it's a transition. So, But, you know, it's, it, 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 I just started by going from patting on the ass to getting kicked in the ass. That's the transition. Yeah, our first year was a great learning curve. You know, we had Wayne Radford left over from the 76 team. Woody was a year ahead of me, Mike Woodson and Butch Carter. And, you know, we had some young guys in there, and, and Ray Tolbert and I, I remember my very first game, I scored 24 points against the Russians, and we got beat. I remember getting on the bus. I was first on the bus, and I was bawling my eyes out. I just remember crying because I, I lost. I mean, I, I did my first game at IU, I lost. What I didn't know was that transition would be the last game I played at IU. I'd win. So yeah. I'll take that first loss against the Russians. But yeah. um, <laughs> you, you, you were so, so enamored by the whole thing. And I remember playing – I guess they're big seven foot four in center, and I'm like, oh my god, what? Have I, and he smelled. He did not smell good, but he, he, <laughs> he, 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 and Tolbert scored 18, and I scored 24, and then of course Knight gets on the bus. And, you know, I'm crying, and, and Ray's sitting with me, and, and he rips everybody on the bus except us, and we're thinking, yeah, cool. And then we go back to practice, start watching film, and we just get torn apart. <laughs> <laughs> it can't really say, it don't matter how many points you score tonight. It, that's not part of the game with him. Yeah, he'll still so you go that did wrong. Yeah, but, but Wayne Radford was, was a great asset and a great leader. Um, Wayne did a great job with, a, you know, not much talent, undeveloped talent. Um, Woody was starting to come into his own, and, and Woody was just a fabulous player, um, although I beat him twice in the sectionals. Um, I never let him forget that either. So every time I, matter of fact, I see him, he coaches the coach at the Clippers out here, so I see him. Uh, I know. We'll see. Like, this is the thing. I, I talked to him last week, and he said, "Hey, get a hold of Steve and bring up that Aurora thing repeatedly." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got Woody. I'll text Woody since we're done here and, and remind him of that. So, <laughs> uh, but but Mike Mike was a great player, and Knight loved Mike, and, and there was great reason to love Mike. Uh, Mike is probably one of the one of the best unsung players. While well, he was lauded. But when you start talking about the Cheneys and the Baileys and, and, and the Buckners and the Mays, you know, Mike was every bit at or above their level as a player. Um, well, actually, I've that. watched IU basketball since whatever I can remember, probably 1975, 76 were the first seasons I remember. And the only guy that I ever saw that I thought was better than Mike Woodson was Isaiah Thomas, and they played completely different positions. Right, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and I'll I get mean, to Isaiah, you know, when we get there, talk about him. You know, but, yeah, you know, yeah he's but, a, 1979, you guys, not a great year. You end up in the NIT, but back no, then, but we, we, you know, 32 we, we, made lemonade, we made lemonade out of, out of lemons. I mean, and yeah, I'm you really got to beat Purdue team. in the final, so it made it all right. Yeah, you yeah. want to talk a little Ohio bit State about State the Indiana-Purdue State. rivalry? We beat Ohio State before that. You know, Ohio State had Williams. And I think Kellogg was a freshman. Was Kellogg on that team? Was he a freshman that year? I think he was. Yeah, he was because a freshman. I think he graduated you know. in '82. Right, he was he was one year behind me, so I I, I was a sophomore. He was then so yeah, but that's back when struggled. the NIT still mattered because you only had I think 32 teams get into the tournament. Yeah, see, we struggled with some leadership issues there. You know, Wayne had gone, and Butch was just a, a, a hot mess. Is the only way I can describe him. Butch was just not a, a, a good catalyst for our basketball team in, in many ways, and. There was a, the mid There was the beginning season marijuana thing that started the whole season off bad. We went to Alaska, and there, there was handled very poorly by some players, and it just we never got on track. And, and then, but it tells you what a genius coach Knight is that he took that team, and, and you know we didn't make the tournament. Of course, that's a year that was it was all bird and magic. Um, and um, but he took that team and said, you know, if we're going to go to the NIT, let's win the damn thing. And you see the genius in him as a coach. He took us who had struggled to what I think fourteen and thirteen or something like that. It's just you know not a good record. And, and at that time in that tournament, we were as good as any team out there, except maybe probably Michigan State, who you know with Kelser and Johnson and, and Vincent and those guys were just indomitable. They were a pro team. You know, half that team went pro and, and, and were good players, but 
we were as good as most any college basketball team at that point. And he just gelled us. And that, that was the, that's the genius of Knight is he prepares everybody to gel at the right time. And that's why yeah, and the sign of a good coach is you're better at the end of the year than you were at the start of the year. There's a lot of teams that go the opposite way. When he was really serious about coaching, there was nobody, no team that made that transition better every year than Indiana. No team. All right, you get to 1980. Isaiah Thomas arrives. You guys go to the Sweet 16. You can kind of see how 79 kind of ran into 80, and the team keeps getting better. You want to talk a little bit about the 80 season and Isaiah? Well, you know, Whitman and, 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 and Kitchell were part of the process at that point in time. Isaiah comes in, and, you know, he's one of these I think Landon Turner that, came that year, too, didn't he? Landon, well, you know, Landon was nowhere near. Landon was a project at that point in time. I mean, Landon was a huge project. Yeah. Um, he, he, he was not a, a major contributor at that point in time, and had he not made a self-professing commitment, he may never have been a contributor, but, you know, we know where he turned out to be in terms of a player. But Isaiah comes in, and, and I'm going to tell you, I, I, there's just these things that where God taps people on the head and said, this is your chosen path. And he tapped Isaiah on the head and said his chosen path was basketball. And from the minute he stepped on the court, we got better every single day we played. I mean, and, and he sharpened all of us up, and he made us all play with more precision play faster, play smarter, um, keep our eyes more focused on what was going on, because if you didn't, you had, you had Spalding wrapped around your forehead because you got hit in the head with a ball you never saw coming. And he'd look at you like, dude, you're open for a layup. Why, why are you not looking at it? And his, his leadership, I mean, I've never seen anybody at his age come in and provide the leadership that Isaiah was able to provide. And, you know, we, we, we just kept getting better and better and better and better and better. You know, we came out, I think, number one that year. We were with the Sports Illustrated cover, and that's the one we were ranked number one in the country. Wasn't that 1980? Not sure. I, I think it was. You're older than me. You remember that better, Steve. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, you know, I'll be 59 this year. Um, it, um, I think that was the year where we came out ranked number one. And then Woody, I think Woody got hurt, and, you know, Ted started having back troubles, and, and we started faltering a little bit. Um, and But Isaiah was, was just a genius. I mean, just just a flat-out basketball genius. We'd well, love to and play the NBA with him and see what he could do there because, I mean, the game is more suited even for his style of play than college basketball was um, because the yeah. offenses are – the defenses are more spread out, more man-to-man, and it, made, it created bigger passing lanes and bigger passing holes and driving holes for him. And there yeah, was nobody to touch he, him. The 80 team loses to Purdue in the Sweet 16. That still upsets me, by the way. I remember yeah, down, and, and of all places, we lose in Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we got a we referee and he's going to beat by, Kentucky, by Purdue. How good is that? But yeah. You know what? You know what? We won our last game we ever played. As a, I won my last game we ever played as a loser. So it's, hey, I keep we'll going back to that, that and saying, <laughs> I know, but, but I, I, I use all these things that happened bad, and I'm like, the end – justified all that but we have to go yeah, down and the thing and, is this the i mean all the way back to the close loss to aurora the close loss in the sweet 16 in 78 you know the loss to purdue in 80 makes that even better when you get to 81 and win it all yeah uh, it, it certainly does uh, but but yeah we, we lost and, and that was an ugly loss i mean you know coach he had no love for purdue at that point in time you know he just he had no love for that university or the players or their concepts or, or how they were doing things and and um, and then have to go lose to him in Rupp, which the team he hated even more than Purdue was Kentucky, or disliked. I don't want to use the word hate. That's an ugly word to use, and I don't like using it, but disliked. Um, so we have to go to Rupp to get beat, and it was it was not a pleasant bus ride home. All right, um, you want to talk a little bit about the Indiana Purdue rivalry? Um, well, I you know. Most of those guys were my friends. I mean, uh, Arnett Hallman, the Walker brothers, I mean, even Drake Morris. I mean, we all played together all summer long. We all came to Indianapolis and go to Butler, and we'd play all summer long together. And, and there was no the, – the rivalry was the school rivalry, not the players per se. Um, you know, we, we respected each other, and, and we all knew we were going to beat each other. I think in the four years I played Purdue – I never won at Mackey, and I don't think Purdue ever won at Assembly Hall. Um, I think I looked that up one time. We, we never, I never won a game in Mackey Arena. 
um, and, and Purdue never won a game in Assembly Hall when, we, when I was playing the four years I was there. So it was, it was, it was, it was a great rival. We loved playing them. I mean, they were good guys. Um, you know, we stepped off the court and we, we yucked about it, and, and the fans were more rabid than the players were about it, and we hated to lose because we knew what it meant. But, uh, you know, it was just another tough loss. We were going to get yelled at on the bus ride home. <laughs> so it didn't matter if it was Purdue. Well, the only game I know was Pittsburgh. I think the big rivalry was Kentucky, and hopefully you oh, didn't like yeah. those guys because I, yeah, I really I still had no love for in the Kentucky Joby Wildcats. Yeah, yeah, he had no love for Joby Hall at all. I mean, he, he wanted no part of losing to those guys, and um, that was the biggest tongue lashing I ever got in my life. Was my senior year when Kentucky beat us at Assembly Hall. Um, we were getting killed so bad the place was dead silent. And he lit into me. Every one of the eighteen thousand people heard every <laughs> single word he said, and they started listening. <laughs> I mean, they just all shut up and started listening. <laughs> I think the game stopped and everybody started listening. <laughs> I'd never heard so somebody all so quiet except for night, and I just got, the you know, let go, <laughs> let go on. But, um, so, you know, the only game the only game we never wanted to lose in my four years there was Northwestern. I mean, we would beat Northwestern by 30 points, and it would be, we, we'd get yelled at more for that than losing to Purdue. Well, it was um, and Northwestern. They just last year made their first ever NCAA tournament. Uh, good for them, you know. And, and uh, McIntosh is a kid that I coached in AAU ball with his dad, and, and um, you know what a great little player he turned out to be. And, and um, you know, I'm going to take all the credit for it right here on your radio show that I'm the one that taught him how to play in the Big Ten. I'm sure his dad's going to see it a little differently, but that's okay. He's there, and, and you know he was a great leader for that basketball team. And that's good. I love to see the parody of the game when teams rise and, and they build their programs and coaches do well. And, I mean, you have to love the game to feel about that. You, you pick your teams you love, but you want to see everybody do well. Um, yeah. You know, you want to see everybody play well. And that's what's great about the college tournament. And that's what's great about the state high school tournament. Everybody rose to, to the occasion. Champions find a way. You know, champions find a way. And, and that's what's great about these one-and-done tournaments. So, but we never wanted to lose to Northwestern, and we never wanted to lose to Hoosier Classic. All right, we get to 1981. If I remember right, in 81, didn't I? You start off like nine and seven, or something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we yeah we had gone to Hawaii um, and gotten our butts handed to us. Got beat by Clemson, and then we ended up losing to Pan America. <laughs> I bet and the only was lucky fun person. Practice. The only lucky person there was Tolbert. Got in trouble and had to take a separate flight home, and we hated him because he was lucky. I made him fly <laughs> home separately, <laughs> and he got to go home straight home. We got stuck in, in Iowa City because it was it was like right before the holidays, before New Year's, and we were flying back, and the storm hit, and we got stuck in, in Iowa, and we got grounded. We couldn't go any farther. So there were two hotel rooms left in the hotel, so we got all the players just, just sitting in the room in Iowa City on New Year's Eve. And um, finally, the, you know, we get a call like at 4 or 5 in the morning. You know, we cleared, we get on the plane, we're going home. And it, it wasn't pleasant. It just wasn't pleasant coming back from, from Hawaii. You know, the, right, I saw so the IU team. From 9 and 7, what, what was the thing that really turned that team around? It, you know, it was, it was really funny, and, and I tell this story uh, quite frequently. What, what was really going on with that team was that Knight, Knight and Thomas were battling for control of the team. Um, they were two great leaders, two different philosophies of how the game should be played, but they both respected them. We were just players torn between who to follow. I mean, do we follow our coach on the court or do we follow our coach on the bench? And we were really, at the beginning of the year, we were wrestling with that because Isaiah wanted to run the team, and Knight wasn't willing to give up control of that basketball team. And then we, I think we go to Iowa. I think it was Iowa, and, and we ended up getting drilled badly. Uh, that's the last game I ever lost as a Hoosier. And we come back to practice the next day, and you know our first question on after loss was, "Are we getting taped?" You know, uh, if you got taped, you put a you put Vaseline on your knees and elbows because you were going to do loose ball drills. Um, yeah. And if people don't know what loose ball drills are, he stands under the basket, rolls the ball out, and if you don't come up with the ball, you run the stairs. So you get the ball. There's whatever <laughs> blood it takes, you get the ball. You don't want to run. Um, so anyway, so we, we lose to Iowa, and we lose badly. And we just think it's going to be just hell, and I'm thinking, man, 10 games left. I'm a senior. I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm just, I'm, I'm just tired of this. Not a good season. 
he comes in, and this is where he makes his famous quote to Connie Chung. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it because I don't know if it's politically correct to, but where he talks about, you know, the one that Connie Chung made a big issue about. He says that to us. He yeah. goes over and sits down. He goes over and sits down and it says, Isaiah, get him going. We never lost another game. We start drilling teams immediately, next game. I think for a long period of time we held the largest average winning margin of victory in the NCAA tournament. It was like 18 and a half points a game. Um, you know, now there were some factors involved in there. Some big teams got knocked out. We got to play the regional in Bloomington. But nonetheless, that was the defining moment of that season was that Iowa loss and night coming and sitting down and, and having a talk and, and making the statement like that, going over and sitting down and just saying, Isaiah, it's your team. And that was the greatest coaching move he ever made Yeah, by not coaching. It was brilliant on his part. And it took a lot of self inner strength for him to do that. But Isaiah took over. We got loose. We got happy. We had fun. And we just looked forward to beating. We look forward to playing anybody. We look forward to beating everybody. That was our mentality. It, it was probably what 76 felt. We weren't playing you. We were just going to beat you. Yeah, and, I always thought that, from watching that 81 team, especially in the tournament, they were just as good as the 76 team, if not better. <laughs> you know, you, you I mean, that's never, a crazy like thing to played, say. You never say, but I would love to play them. I'll tell you what, I would have loved to have played them because I'd have gotten Benny thrown out of the game in no time. So, you know, <laughs> I'd have got him to take one swing at me and he'd have been gone. You know, I'd have made him swing at me. Yeah, but so, you look at that team, your team, the first round of the tournament would have been the second round because you guys, I think, had a buy into the second round. Yeah, then you yeah, played Maryland. Maryland, Maryland was a play, good yeah. team coached by Lefty Rizal, I think it was. Oh, the they had Albert Gary... King, they had Buck Williams, they had a great team. We thought we were getting beat. Yeah, and you guys beat them something like 99 to 54 or something, Killing. wasn't it? Hey, I'll tell you how bad it was. My friend went to Wittenberg University, which is right there in the suburb of Dayton. I had packed to go to spring break. I thought Merrill was going to kill us. I'm getting on the bus. I'm not even going to ride home with the bus with the team. I'm a senior. I'm going to go with him on to Florida. So yeah. I packed all my clothes to leave from Dayton with him just to go to spring break. And um, we ended up winning huge, and then we never looked back. Yeah, and then and, you get to but, go to Assembly Hall to play the Sweet 16. Can't get any better Yeah, than I think that. That, was la- that was the last time a college team ever got to host <laughs> a Mid-East Regional or regional after that debacle. Because, you know, it's important. Yeah, you guys but, played but UAB. Was, UAB actually played you guys fairly tough. They were though. very good. Yeah, they were, they were, they were coached by Gene Bartow. Um, yeah. they, they were a good basketball team. I mean, we, we feared them. We feared them big time. Um, but, you know, we ended up cruising through there. Then you get into the Final Four with four great teams. You know, we LSU with, with Rudy Macklin, Dwayne Scales, Virginia with Sampson and Lamp and Raker. And, and then you go over to, to North Carolina with Worthy and, and Perkins and Al Wood, three All-Americans. Yeah, and, and that final and 40 LSU down. game, I mean, you guys were down at the half, I think. Yeah, yeah, we were, yeah, yeah. And and it was it was just, you know, I mean, they, you know, the key to the tournament, and of course Isaiah played great, and Landon stepped up, and Landon had, had matured, and it did just happen in the tournament. Landon had worked his tail off for three years to get to that point to where he was going to make those kind of contributions in the tournament. But the, really the quiet key in that was Whitman. Randy just played such steady, no mistake, fundamentally sound, opportunistic basketball in that tournament that he took advantage of every opportunity given to him and made it hurt the other team and help us. Yeah, and he unless you go back and watch the films too. of him or play with him, you would never see that because you were so enthralled with, with, with Turner and Tolbert and, and, and Isaiah. Um, but Randy is the guy I think that really was the catalyst, the, the game changer of aside from the three expectants that we had in, um, in, in, in the big three. Yeah. And boy, what's the feeling you wake up the morning of your last college basketball game and you're playing in a national championship against North Carolina. I think it was at the spectrum in Philadelphia. You want to walk yeah. us through that day and the time leading well, up to the game? It's a funny story. It, it, it actually was in Sports Illustrated. Um, we're sitting around, and, you know, we're all in, in the hotel. We're in Cherry Hills, New Jersey, and that kind of took us out, you know, away from everything. So we weren't staying at the spectrum or any, any hotel right in Philadelphia or anything like that. We were in over New Jersey, and we're watching a soap opera, and I think it was Young and the Restless. Isaiah swears it was All My Children, but I, I, you know, I don't know. I can't remember that far back. But all of a sudden, Newsflash comes on. 
<clears throat> and all the guys were in our, our, our room. And um, I blurred out, watch, Reagan's been shot, and they're going to cancel the game. <laughs> before, it, it, before it, had, it came on the air. Of course, we didn't have Twitter back then. You didn't so, know John yeah. Hinckley, did you? <laughs> no, I did not know John Hinckley. Uh, but I blurred it out, and then all of a sudden it's the first words of everybody's mouth. And bingo. Uh, you know, it, 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 and everybody's like, Risley? You know, just, it was just a – it was a funny story once we found out Reagan was okay. It was yeah. not a story I would ever told that something more serious happened to President Reagan at the time. But it was it's okay to tell it now because, you know, he, he came out of it that evening fairly smoothly. Um, but the Bruins, again, night immediately gathered us all together, put us in our basketball gear and took us away from everything, took us away from all media. We had no idea what was going on. We went into full game preparation. Um, we never lost any focus on what our objective was that night. We did not know what was happening. We did not know that the game was being – we didn't know until 30 minutes before the game whether they were going to play the game or not. Um, you know, and we, we just assumed the game was going on. And I suspect this may have been the difference in that game because by all everything on paper, North Carolina should have beat us. I mean, they just had more. Well, they more beat you earlier points. in the season, didn't they? Um, yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, they beat us. Yeah, they beat us. Yeah, we went to North Carolina and got beat badly by them. Um, but by all accounts, they should have won that game. But I think Knight just – Again, brilliantly coached us to where we had no unfocus about anything but winning a basketball championship. And, um, you know, we came into the game prepared. It was a dogfight the first half, and then Whitman hits that jumper at the buzzer. And it just, it's like you felt like, you looked at North Carolina, you felt like, man, they feel like they've thrown their best shot at us, and we haven't fallen apart. And then we came yeah, out the second half. Yeah, you got the second half. Well, Isaiah, Isaiah dominated the first five yeah. minutes of the second half. You know, Isaiah came out and made the steal and the layup. It's on the cover of every sporting magazine. Um, and, and he just, you know, the first five minutes of that game, Knight always said the first five minutes of each half determines whether you win the game or not. And we lit it up in the first five minutes. And then you build a lead like that. And you got the steady Eddie players. I mean, you know, Jimmy Thomas and I split the rest of the time. Um, Ted had gotten into foul trouble. And then um, – uh, and Landon finally fouled out. So Jimmy Thompson and I, you know, players are not prone to make a lot of mistakes and not try a lot of stupid things. Um, and we just we just controlled the ball, controlled the, controlled the game, and controlled the tempo of the game. And Isaiah was the point of controlling all of that. And we were working in harmony with him, and, and North Carolina knew they had no chance at that point in time. So what so, was your relationship with Knight while you were there, and what was it after you had graduated? Um, the relationship with Knight, you know, I, I, you know, was not one of the players that had a very close relationship with him as a player. You know, some guys were always in his office, always talking to him or anytime, you know, I was not one of those players he always called her over to talk to. I was probably a little bit intimidated by him my, most of my time there. Um, not really ever sure what he expected or, you know, or if I could deliver on what he expected. Um, but he can't, you know, he always counted on me and I played the key moments many times in my career, but as the years grew on and on and on right now, you know, I have his number, I could pick up the phone and call him right now and he would talk let's to call me. Him, and, and, <laughs> yeah, let's do, he's probably out here somewhere fishing. Um, but, um, and that's with any player. <clears throat> I mean, he comes back quietly to Indianapolis um, many times during the year and just goes to a little restaurant dinner called um, Working Man's Friend um, down, downtown and, and um, call, we get a phone call like on Tuesday from Abernathy or Green saying, hey, coach is coming and he wants to have dinner with us. And we all go there and it's, it closes the place down for us and we just, there's 15, 20 players there. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be in that inner circle now and get that call and, and um, we just sit and talk about things and, and he barbs on us and Finally, I feel comfortable with barbing back at him. <laughs> I'm, old, I'm 58 years old, and I finally feel comfortable barbing back at him. <laughs> well, Better late than never, coach. Steve. I still call him coach. So the relationship now is, is very good. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a tough guy to get to know. I mean, he's a, he keeps his guard up. He has an inner circle of friends. And um, when you crack that inner circle, it, it's really, really, you know, an experience. Um, because you, you then you have carte blanche with anything you need with him. 
Um, yeah, well, I imagine it has to be like that with him because you get so many people that have ulterior motives. Yeah, I think more so. You know, I, yeah, I think he, you know, by the way he coached and by the way people never understood him, um, because they never got to spend enough time with him. Um, if you spent the four years with him, I mean, actually, I've known Coach Knight what for forty something years since I was seventeen years old when he started recruiting me, or you know, and talking and things. And um, so I've known him that long. And, and when you get to know him, you, you understand that there's a method to his madness. That it's it's just a teaching style, and you know, not to be taken personally. And you have to. And I got the greatest advice ever when the first time I ever met Coach Knight from Kent Benson. And Kent, we were driving up to Sunday Hall, and I was in Kent's car, and he'd take me around campus, and we were getting ready to pull him. He goes, now listen, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. And I'm sure you've heard this before. Don't listen to how he says it. Listen to what he says. If you listen to how he says it, you will fail here. If you listen to what he says, you will succeed for the rest of your life. And that was words from Kent Benson that stick with me today. And every time yeah. I speak to anybody, I tell them that. When you got somebody you think's an ogre or tough, don't listen to how they're saying it. Try and listen to what they're saying. And if you can discern what they're saying and you learn how great a teacher Coach Knight is. Coach Knight's the greatest teacher I ever had in my life. Um, you know, aside from being a basketball coach, he was a great teacher. Um, and well, and that's crack, how you be a great coach is to be a great teacher. I think that's it, you know. And, and, and you know, there's different styles. Obviously, Al McGuire in that same period was a completely different style than Coach Knight, and he connected with his players. And Knight, <clears throat> being his style, connected with his players. So there's more than one way to skin a cat, there's no doubt. But once you figured out Knight's codes and, and knew what your expectations were of you and you started to live up to him and you gained more and more respect from him, once you gained that respect, I mean, it meant something when he patted you on the ass and smiled at you. It didn't happen very often. Um, but you know, when it did, it felt so good. And you felt like he'd really earned it. You didn't feel like it was just a, a good-handed thing. You felt like, you know, I did something really good. I pleased him. I earned that. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted you, again, not participation awards. You know, he wanted you to earn something like that, earn his respect, not just have it given to you. So Yeah. But, all right, so you get out of Indiana. You get drafted in the 1981 NBA draft by the Phoenix Suns in, I think, the sixth round. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about your experience with the NBA? Well, you know, the thing about that, back in those days was we didn't have the preparation opportunity that these kids do today. I mean, you know, first off now the draft's only two rounds, so a lot of free agents um, are out there hooking up with teams and things. But, you know, we didn't have the summer leagues per se. Um, you know, summer leagues happened after rookie camp, not before. We didn't have these um, these um, clinics they all went to or whatever they're called, these, where all the players go and show their skills. Um and things like that. You know, we just got the call, and I got a call from um, Colangelo and said, hey, we got tickets for you. Do you want to come down and try out? And, um, <clears throat> you know, I said, sure, and um, went down there and, and really wasn't prepared. You know, just really you're not prepared to make that transition from a complete transition from a college game to a professional game. And that's the biggest transition you'll make in your life because, you know, high school to college, is a lot of the same. Um, coach still dominates things, um, and you're just playing against better players, so you're upping your level of play. The college to NBA is a different world. It's two different worlds. And, you know, we weren't as prepared as, say, a kid coming out of college today trying to make an NBA program. They get such better preparation, and you're able to showcase your skill sets a lot better um, th th than you were back then. But, you know, it, it was a great experience. Uh, Phoenix was the town I loved. I was the last player cut in their rookie camp. Key operative word there was cut. So, um, you know, it, and really the politicalness of it, they said it came down to me and a kid named Craig Dykstra, who was their third-round pick. Um, their first-round pick was Larry Nance. Their second-round pick was Sam Clancy, who ended up playing football for the Colts. Um, and their third-round pick was a kid named Craig Dykstra out of uh, a school in California. And I was a sixth-round pick. I played well. And Colangelo called me in and said, look, we're going to let you go. We think you played as well as our third-round pick, but 
politically it makes us look better to keep our third round pick and rather than cut the, you know the third round pick and keep the sixth round pick so that's just the mechanics of the professional game it's a game then it's a business then so at yeah, that point and then you, you know, went you how did you end up in Italy in Europe. Italy was was different. You know, I went over to Italy for a while and averaged you know, about 20 points a game to the team. Uh, back then, the game was a lot more rudimentary than it is today. Um, I was playing in a town called Trevisio, which was their first year in the, the upper league, and we were really bad. Um, you know, you were so you played some of your games in chicken wire cages because <laughs> the fans would throw bottles and stuff on the court. Uh, there was a lot of betting involved, I think, in the process. And, and um and, uh, you know, I went over there, and, and, and just at that point, it wasn't nearly as glamorous as it is today. And you're over there, and, and you're alone, and, you know, you get a little homesick and things. So I came back, met who is now my wife of 33 years, asked her if she wanted to go back with me. She said, I don't know you well enough to go trace and half around the world with you. I said, <laughs> fine, I'm probably never going to make it in the NBA. Let's go do something else with your life. And that was that. So, so. What did you do with the rest of your life? <laughs> I spent 25 years working for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Had a great career with them. Um, retired um, in 2009 from them. Um, and just been doing some uh, consulting work and, and doing some uh, independent selling of some medical products on my own and kind of just enjoying things. I'm chasing my son's tail now. Um, he's out here in, um, in Hollywood trying to make it in movie business as a pre- in production, not in acting. And so we basically had nothing really keeping us in Indianapolis. Loved to play golf and uh, play golf year-round out here. And, you know, not to shut down in November like you do in Indiana. And we're out here just kind of, you know, riding the waves. So it's uh, just it's all about our family now and about our son and seeing him succeed and having fun with him. I get to spend so, time with Alford. I see uh, uh, a lot of Alford. I've got a lot of UCLA practices. And, um, you know, because campus is not too far from where we live and, uh, He's very cordial about coming, and, and um, it's really funny. I mean, you know, I, I go to – I went to the USC-UCLA game, and I'm, I'm there with my with some friends, and I'm thinking, you know, the place isn't sold out. It's Pollock Pavilion. The place isn't sold out. And I'm thinking, this is their IU-Purdue. And it, it just – the atmosphere was not there as what would be in, in, in Mackey or Assembly Hall. Well, yeah, so those are really – there are two football schools. I mean, UCLA is probably more of a basketball school, but USC is a football school. Indiana and Purdue were basketball schools. Yeah. Well, really, Purdue was a pretty good football team. But, yeah, I, I see your point. You know, I, I, Purdue was yeah, good. I mean, if you go to an football, Indiana-Purdue like football it. game, it's probably not like a USC-UCLA football game. Uh, probably not. No, I, you know, I have not, I'm you know, hoping to experience that this year um, and go to that game. But um, – I just was surprised. The game was more styled like a pro game. You know, they 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 played you know organ music more so. Or they had a DJ up there playing, and you know their cheers look more like Laker girls than they did you know Hoosier cheerleaders. And it just was a different atmosphere. First time I you know really experienced West Coast basketball um, to the level of what nobody does it like the state of Indiana does. You know, and and we showcase the game the way I think Naismith one of the games to be played all the way from, you know, little leagues now all the way up until, you know, the, the college game. And hopefully we get the Pacers going at some point in their their tenure too. So, um, but it, it's it's different. I mean, and, but it's just an honor and privilege to play uh, basketball in the state of Indiana. It, it, you know, and to play in Indiana, you know, when my son was younger, we would go to Disney World or we would travel and we'd go through airports and people would stop and say, Hey, are you Steve Risley? Did you play in the end? They'd ask for my autograph, and it wasn't the fact that it was me; it was the fact that I was an IU basketball player. And my son was just in awe of that. That you know, we'd be in Charlotte Douglas Airport, and people would stop, or we'd be in Orlando, and people would ask for your autograph. And there's so many Hoosier fans, and all over the place. And, and you know, it, it, it's just something you just—it's a privilege and an honor to have experienced all of it and to be able to talk well, about it today. Well, hopefully Archie Miller can bring a little bit of that back to IU basketball. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think so. I, I think it's been a process. I, I think that, you know, I mean, and it's not unlike what a lot of schools go through. I mean, UCLA kind of went through the same thing. Um, you know, Kentucky comes back quick, but who knows what Kentucky does 
I don't think they cheat. <laughs> and we all know I what think, Kentucky does, Steve, but we won't talk well, about it. Well, you know, my, my point on that is they, the NCAA has got to have the Hubble telescope pointed at those guys. If they're cheating, it ain't cheating because, you know, they ain't getting caught. And, and I, I just think that, you know, Calipari's built a program to where he's, he's figured out. See, what Calipari's done so great is he's figured out the, the two-year process. You know, the problem with Knight would never survive today because Knight was a four-year coach. You know, he built his teams to the seniors made the contribution. Yeah, but, Steve, if you look at Kentucky, other than uh, what, the one or two years, that one or two-year thing hasn't really worked. And a lot of times they lose the teams that have guys that have been there three or four years. I mean, the Wisconsin yeah, it's, game, it's, the year they were true. undefeated, it's I think, true. is a perfect example of that. Yeah, it's true. I mean, but the undefeated team, you know, Wisconsin plays a game of their life. And, and, you know, and, and I felt bad for the Kentucky players at that point in time. Um, but because I, did, I, was in, I was actually in a, you know, a food establishment where they're playing the game in Kentucky. And those Kentucky fans can be kind of annoying. Sure. Well, no, I mean, you know, bother and, and, me. <laughs> they got more championships than we do. So, uh, you know, it, and, and I, but I see the purity of it. And to me, I, I felt horrible for those kids to work that hard and to lose that game and be so close to, putting a perfect season together in a national championship because one of the things I could never imagine was getting to the championship game and, and having lost and not won it. I yeah. don't, I, I can't imagine what that would be like for the rest of your life to, to, to say that you got to the championship game. Did you win? No. You know, and to not be able to, to show people that ring. And I can't imagine that, what that would be like. So, and that's kind of how it was for Kentucky, but nonetheless, Archie Miller, I, I think what we what people are going to like about Archie is I think he's going to be a little bit of a throwback to the, the Knight mentality without being Knight. Um, I think he's an updated version. I think you're going to see very tenacious basketball team, very physical team. Um, you'll see probably a, a very fast-paced team running up and down the floor un, under control. You know, I think Crean's fast break game in, in 95 to 92 wins was really out of control basketball. Um, but I think that Archie's going to put a lot of control on, on how the offense is structured, how the fast breaks are structured, and I think they're going to be a really bitch to play against defensively. And that's what we all come to expect about Indiana basketball. Is, yeah, is that's just, what Indiana basketball know, was was for 20 or 30 years. Right, until night left, right. And then, and then we brought in some people that wanted to change the, the persona, and we weren't ready for that change. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, sometimes I wonder if we were – more more disappointed that we lost night or that the team changed how they played basketball. And obviously how they played didn't work. Um, and, you know, we had big disenchantment in the program. I mean, you know, we lost fans. We lost support. And, and you know, I give Crean credit. You know, he, he, he righted the ship to some degree, and he got, got us back to being a relevant basketball program. Um, I think Tom Crean did all he could probably do with Indiana basketball. Yeah, and, and I think it was time for Archie Miller to come in, but you, you, you got to give Tom some thanks, and some kudos for, you know, bringing it back to a level of relevance. Um, but I don't think he ever would have taken the team any farther than it, than it got. He never would have. He didn't have the coaching set and skills to win at that level. Um, and we'll see if Archie does. You know, obviously with his brother at Arizona, he's got a lot of, you know, uh, other chefs to, to to you know check ingredients on and. I think he's his own guy. He's done a heck of a job at Dayton. I think everybody's really excited. I'm very excited. Um, you know, I, I go on and I say I think, you know, it's the perfect choice. I know there were some other candidates in there and that that people got kind of behind, and I, I think they wouldn't have, for different reasons, wouldn't have been the right choice. I think a mistake would have been to bring another former player back to Indiana to try and coach the team. We just would have yeah. relived the night saga. It just would have would have opened that casket one more time. And yeah, it's just like the people always wanted Steve Alford back. I mean, it's just yeah, it would have just been a constant was, reminder. And I think Steve wanted to come. I, I you know, I've not, you know, I never spoke about it. I never asked him about it. But I think that it's where he wanted to end up. You know, and he would never say that because he loves UCLA. Um, but I think that he's better off where he is. I think the expectations on Steve. Would have been so high. Yeah, I don't know that anybody could have lived up to him, and he probably saved himself. Um, but Archie, you know, I, everything that you've seen about him and done, and 
how he's spoken, how he's coached the team, what his latest expectations are, have been what we all come to love and to expect about Indiana basketball. So I'm excited to watch these guys go. Give them some time. Don't expect a national championship this year. You know, the biggest coup there was was um, getting um, Schilling on board. You know, Schilling's yeah. a master recruiter. That guy can recruit. I mean, it's going to hurt Alford big time losing him. I mean, it's it's going to really put a strain on Alford's program um, to lose an Ed Schilling. Um, that guy – is just a genius at being able to recruit the right talent and getting the right fit um, and bringing the right player into that program. And, and he's going to make Archie look real good real quick. These kids are going to mature a little bit, and they're going to blend and gel, and it's going to be over and done with. All right, Steve, I want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. It was an honor to talk to you about the Indiana High School Basketball Tournament, about Bobby Knight and your time at Indiana. Um, would love to have you back sometime. Maybe we'll talk a little Indiana basketball. You've got my telephone number. Anytime during the season, let's let's get back together and and, um, and see where we are about mid season. See if the expectations are being met. Um, if we set them too high, or if we haven't set them high enough. Um, but All right. It, Thanks a lot, Steve. Tell. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Uh, thanks for coming on. I want to remind everybody, you can go to thegrillingtruth.net to check out all of our shows. Um, also, you can go to iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spreaker, Google Music, anywhere you find sports podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. So for Steve Risley, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.